today I had a uh, subscriber requested rant. My buddy there, Mark Thiethke, who's uh, in one of these pro wrestling groups, I think the world's greatest wrestling discussion over on Facebook. Of course, I have my group, The Foreign Object. And uh, so the, the debate came up, where does the Hart Foundation, the 1997 version, uh, rank in the all-time great wrestling factions? And, of course, they were awesome. I mean, that whole Calgary Stampede pay-per-view uh, from Calgary, uh, where the uh, Brian Pillman, Owen Hart, Jim Neidhart, Bret Hart, and uh, Owen Hart teamed up in the five-on-five five against, uh, I think it was Steve Austin, Ken Shamrock, uh, the Legion of Doom and Goldust. I mean, what a what a great main event. I mean, very interesting to see a five-on-five five main event on a major show like that. Probably the only other times we've seen that type of um, activity is at War Games uh, pay-per-view over in WCW or the Survivor Series. I'm sure there's some other uh, big multiple-man matches that I'm forgetting, but as far as a five-on-five, five, that really comes to mind. So, yeah, I mean, the Varsity, uh, so many great groups. I'm going to get into them. Uh, but the Hart Foundation in 97 were obviously a, a great group. But I kind of uh, jokingly stated, you know, where do these guys rank? I just kind of came up with a number and said number nine. And Mark, as he were, were, would challenge me on that and say, okay, well, who's number one through eight? And, you know, not ducking down from a challenge uh, today. I said, well, I can do this, and uh, but I actually sat here for the better part of half an hour, and I had one list, and then I kind of put that to a side because I had scratched it out, and honestly, it's just so many great groups that you could put a lot of these groups in any type of order. There's also some honorable mentions, some groups that I know exist that I'm not terribly familiar with, and once again, folks, this stuff is all subjective. I mean, there are no statistics there are no, um, you know, win-loss records in professional wrestling. It's it's very uh, subjective stuff here, folks. I mean, so let's just take kind of the seriousness out of our tone for a moment. But at the same time, if we're going to make a list, let's make a list. Let's put some thought into it. Uh, there's tons of assholes and idiots online that are going to make lists that they don't know what they're talking about. I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but my breadth of knowledge goes to a certain point. It doesn't uh, cover some things. For instance, one of my honorable mentions right off the bat, a lot of you guys would probably put these these guys in number one or number two, uh, the Bullet Club. You know, I just, I'm not familiar enough with their work uh, to tell you where they would rank. Uh, they're not among my favorites. I do acknowledge that they've had so many great members like a Finn Balor, uh, you know, the, the Omegas and, and all these guys. Uh, AJ Styles, of course, but I mean, as as far as where does the Bullet Club rank among my list, uh, it, they don't just because I'm not familiar, but that's not to uh, take away from what you might think of them. But I'm going to give you my list starting right now. So number 10 coming in, uh, this one probably very obscure to a lot of you guys, unless you're an old school wrestling fan, uh, Hyatt and Hot Stuff International. Now, you might be thinking, what the fuck is that? Well, that was a group that was kind of a merging of two groups. Uh, Missy Hyatt was the female manager in the mid-'80s. Uh, she had gone from world-class championship wrestling, where she got her start, uh, thanks to Michael Hayes and John Tatum and so forth. And she had come over to the UWF. Uh, she was really, you know, before Sonny, you know, uh, 10 years later, before a lot of these... Um, women managers. Uh, Missy Hyatt was really ahead of the game. She was really a pioneer. She doesn't get a lot of credit. Um, but Missy Hyatt, you know, she had her guys, which were basically John Tatum, uh, her kind of boyfriend, Hollywood Johnny Tatum, and Jack Victory, which was more or less their kind of secondary stooge guy, kind of a heater, kind of a tag team partner, kind of a fall guy. Uh, John, uh, that's Jack Victory. John Tatum was obviously the leader of the group. And then Missy Hyatt was kind of their manager. And then Sting, meanwhile, uh, was in this group called um, Hot Stuff, you know, Hot Stuff Incorporated, which was Sting, Rick Steiner, and Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. And I think at the beginning of that uh, group there in Mid-South, uh, our buddy there, the Ultimate Warrior, known at the time as one of the Blade Runners, I think he was called... Uh, I think he was called Blade Runner Rock, believe it or not. So you had Blade Runner Rock and Blade Runner Sting. I think I have that correct. And then basically Blade Runner Rock, you know, went off and became the Dingo Warrior and then the Ultimate Warrior. But basically you had these two, two kind of heel factions that kind of merged. And then the storyline with this was really pretty awesome. 
that basically the head of Hyatt uh, International, Missy Hyatt, and the leader of Hot Stuff Incorporated, Eddie Gilbert, were having a liaison, an affair, okay? So uh, mixing business with pleasure. I mean, you think about, um, you know, uh, the Theranos group in real life a few years ago, but I mean, basically this, this corporate... Uh, entity, this corporate merger was tainted uh, by the sex, by the, the behind the scenes love of Missy Hyatt and Andy Gilbert. And this stuff kind of did fall over into real life because apparently this was actually going on in real life. Uh, John Tatum, for what it was worth, he was a good sport about it. Uh, he played along, uh, even though in some regard he was losing this woman, Missy Hyatt. So there you go. That's my number 10. What was their biggest accomplishment as a, as a unit? Uh, really, I think the storyline was the biggest accomplishment because it was very good riveting TV for several months. I believe they also had the tag team title within that group in one variation and another. I think Tatum and Victory had the tag team title. And then it was actually, I believe, uh, Sting and, and Rick Steiner had the tag team title in that group, uh, the UWF tag team title. Number nine is what it brought us here in the first place, gentlemen, the Hart Foundation, the 1997 version. Now, you can also say that this lineage of the Hart Foundation goes back to the really a decade earlier, the mid 80s, uh, Jim the Anvil Neidhart, Brett the Hitman Hart and Jimmy Hart. Although the Hart Foundation that came along, you know, basically 11 or 12 years later was much different. Uh, Jimmy Hart by that time was over in WCW. <laughs> This group was not just a tag team. It was a, a, a faction, a Canadian faction, a family faction in many ways. Uh, Brian Pillman kind of being the only non-blood relative or marriage relative of the group, as far as we know. Uh, Jim Neidhart and Davey Boy Smith had married Hart sisters, sisters to Owen and Bret Hart. So those guys are all brothers and brothers-in-law. That's interesting. What would um, Jim Neidhart and... Uh, Davy Boy Smith be to each other if they had both married sisters of the same group. I guess they would also be brothers-in-law, correct? Um, you know, kind of once removed, but they would both be brothers-in-law because they had both married sisters. So that's interesting. But in any regard, uh, this group was great. The reason why I don't have them higher, uh, gentlemen, and and uh, if there's any women who would possibly find this YouTube channel, one pro wrestling and sports fan YouTube channel. Why I don't have the Hart Foundation higher is simply longevity. Unfortunately for all of us, Owen Hart, um, you know, he would eventually uh, pass away in 99. But Brian Pillman, effectively, when he died in October of 97, that effectively ran, uh, you know, ended the group. And then basically a month later, I mean, all these horrible things happened to this group within a month. You know, Brian Pillman dies in October of 97. And then in November of 97, uh, the, quote, infamous screw job, quote, Montreal screw job, Bret Hart. I believe uh, Jim Neidhart and Davey Boy Smith also ended up leaving the WWF, which they don't really talk about that a whole lot, but that's true. Owen, the, the sole survivor, would stick around. And uh, But, yeah, the Hart Foundation was done. So I think the Hart Foundation, that particular group, I mean, they didn't even get started till maybe May of 97. I mean, I think if you look at the chronological order of things, the Bret Hart, Steve Austin, I quit match at WrestleMania 13. That was, I believe, in, um, was that uh, late March of 97? And then basically they, they turned Bret Hart baby face, or heel. He has to bring in Owen and Davey Boy, and then eventually Jim Neidhart, and eventually Pillman. But that all kind of took over several months. It didn't happen overnight. And by the time he did the Calgary Stampede, and then the next month was the infamous pile driver from Owen Hart to Steve Austin, you know, these guys really didn't have a whole lot of time. So maybe six or seven months at the very most. A lot of that time, Bret Hart was injured for a good portion of that time. You know, we saw things like Davey Boy Smith fighting, you know, with Ken Shamrock and so forth. So anyway, the Hart Foundation 97 version gets to be number nine. Anything that came after that, as far as Natalia or her husband, who's actually a really nice guy, or, or Cesaro, all that stuff that came t another 10 or 20 years later, doesn't really count towards this. Number eight, interestingly enough, Owen Hart, 
uh, makes another uh, appearance, a Nation of Domination. Yes, this is just my personal favorites, folks. I'm not claiming that this is the you know essential list uh, by anyone else's standards, but Nation of Domination, once again, 1997, really became an all-star group. I mean, it started, it had a couple of different metamorphoses. You had Farouk, you know, the former Ron Simmons. You had Brian Adams' crush. You had Savio Vega. And um, you even had uh, PG-13 from Memphis coming in a few times as kind of the lackeys. They really did have an interesting six-man tag team match at WrestleMania 13 once again. I mean, 97 was really a fun year for pro wrestling, uh, especially WWF and WCW. Uh, however, Nation of Domination, eventually they did a nice storyline too. I think as you're seeing a theme here, folks, I like these factions that actually have a storyline to them and some changes and some twists and turns. And so The Rock uh, kind of taking over the group from Farouk, um, Brian Adams and, and uh, Savio were replaced. You know, I mean, they put uh, guys like Ahmed Johnson and Mark Henry and and uh, Dilo Brown in the group and uh, The Rock. I mean, this is what kind of launched The Rock, to be honest with you. So the Nation of Domination, uh, eventually The Rock takes over the group, gives the gifts out. You know, if you remember that, the painting of himself to Farouk, all these wonderful things. I really put the, the group really pretty high, number eight. Now you might be wondering, well, gee whiz, Mike, uh, there couldn't possibly be a third group from 1997 WWF on this list, could there? Well, guess what? There is. Uh, others would probably put these guys at number one, number two, or number three. I'm putting them down at number seven, and I'll get into that uh, coming up. But DX, uh, you had several different variations of the group. The original group basically started in late August of 97. There was kind of this mixed match tag team match on Raw. This is how DX got started. I believe it was Commissioner Monsoon demanded that um, Mankind and The Undertaker team up against Shawn Michaels and Triple H. Now, going into this match, Shawn Michaels was still technically a babyface, although he had been leaning towards a heel. He had some issues with The Undertaker. Uh, Triple H and Mankind coming out of SummerSlam 97 had some issues. So the idea was, I'm going to, uh, Monsoon, I believe it was Monsoon who made this decision, I'm going to put a couple of guys together in a tag team match that may not get along, but their enemy of choice is on the other side. So basically you were combining two feuds. You were combining the feud of Undertaker and Shawn Michaels that was just starting to brew up because of the SummerSlam referee stuff, and you were combining... The ongoing Mankind Triple H feud. Somebody's calling me. Don't they realize I'm terribly busy? I don't have time for these goddamn phone calls. I mean, the fucking phone never rings until I'm in the middle of doing something important. And I can't even reach the fucking phone uh, to turn it off. I'm very upset. I, I don't like people calling me when I'm in the middle of things. And that goddamn phone is so fucking loud. I can't even turn it off. I'm just going to have to sit here patiently. Until the per thank you, God damn it. So uh, anyway, DX uh, kind of comes together. Triple H had uh, China in his corner. I think at the time he was just called uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. I think you know he became Triple H around this time. You have China. You have Rick Rude kind of floating around. It was really pretty interesting. And. Um, you know, DX, and then kind of when Shawn Michaels gets injured at the Royal Rumble in 98, he still has one more match at, at Mania 14 in 98, loses the title of Steve Austin. I believe it was the very next night on Monday Night Raw that Triple H kind of brought in Shawn uh, Pack Waltman, you know, his new buddy. Uh, they bring in the road dog, Jesse James, the badass Billy Gunn, and you kind of have like this second run of DX as uh, initially they were heels, but then they started feuding with our number eight spot or my number eight spot, the Nation of Domination, we kind of became pseudo baby faces, then full on baby faces, the suck it chant, the DX, uh, the, the chop clock and all that crap. So, I mean, DX was really pretty much top of the charts for a while. So I'm giving DX number seven. Uh, that phone call just pisses me off. I mean, I, I always have my goddamn phone on mute. And then the one time that I fucking forget, some asshole has to call me. You know what I mean? So it's just disturbing to me. Um, I would apologize, but I'm not going to. Number six. Uh, so now we're getting 
far away from the late 90s WWF, is about as far as you can get. This, this choice is going to surprise some people, but I'm going to do it. Akbar's Army. Now, for the old school wrestling fans, you know exactly who I'm talking about. For the younger fans, you probably have no clue who I'm talking about. World-class championship wrestling in the early to mid-80s, even going into the early 90s, there was this general manager, uh, the General Skandor Akbar. I believe he was, <laughs> he, he was billed as being from Iraq. Uh, but he was kind of like an Italian guy. But uh, basically, General Skandor Akbar was just a great heel manager. He was kind of short. Um, it was just like the it was like the least effort into pretending to be Iraqi, but somehow pulling it off. Like this guy was just kind of detestable, uh, and he always had like the most interesting kind of monster heels. He had like the uh, he had the missing link. He had Kamala. He had Killer Khan at one point. I mean, this guy, Akbar's army, if they ever wanted to make the Freebirds, even when the Freebirds were in the middle of the feud with the Von Erics, if he ever wanted to uh, be a heel, so to speak, uh, if they ever wanted to make the Freebirds babyface, they'd just have him go, go up against Akbar's army. Uh, so they were like the lowest of the low. I mean, they were like the the foreigners and the weirdos. And uh, when I say that, I mean like the missing link and the super destroyers. And uh, later on, I think PY Chu high, even when they, I believe when they finally kind of took away the world-class championship wrestling name and they went to USWA United States wrestling Alliance. And uh, they, you know, Jerry Jarrett bought the promotion from the Von Erics. Uh, from Carrie and Kevin, it, it just seemed to me that Akbar's army was just a really great long term. We're talking years and years. And not only that, but they also kind of dominated two promotions. And I, I think they kind of went back and forth. But I think Akbar's army did a lot of stuff in the Mid South wrestling for Bill Watts, and he did UWF, which was the later version of, of Mid South. And I just feel that time has kind of not treated Akbar's army very friendly. Uh, but all the stuff that Akbar's army did in world class and in uh, the UWF, I think, is kind of unrecognized. When people kind of wax nostalgic for world class championship wrestling, they always go right to the Freebirds and Von Erichs, which is fine. But I feel like they forget about Akbar's army because I think the stuff that he did, you know, in, in having this other heel group. I mean, you can't just have three wrestlers be the entire heel side. So Akbar and his troops, his his uh, often changing troop of guys, you know, like I said, whether it's the Super Destroyers or or you know, feuding with Iceman Parsons and and uh, the the Buck Zumhoff, who we now know is not a great guy himself, but uh, Akbar's army, I feel, is is really not giving them much love. The goddamn flowers that people give, I'm giving them the goddamn flowers. Number five, once again. This is going to shock and amaze you, especially you younger fans. You're going to be very confused when I say this. Number five is the Legion of Doom. Who is the Legion of Doom? Well, you might be thinking, oh, isn't that what they call the Road Warriors? Perhaps, but at a prior time, the Legion of Doom was not just the Road Warriors. It inferred uh, Jake the Snake Roberts, the Road Warriors, the Spoiler, all managed by Precious Paul Ellering. Now, this is going into 1984. This is going into, uh, the, like, the biggest and the last year of greatness for Georgia Championship Wrestling before they were kind of bought out by uh, Vince McMahon on the Saturday stuff. But I feel like this group, the Road Warriors, the Spoiler, Jake the Snake, managed by Precious Paul, they kind of put the gauntlet down. They put the template down for what a heel faction would be later on uh, with groups like the Four Horsemen. You had two individual singles wrestlers, the Spoiler and Jake the Snake. The Spoiler is going after the, the regional number one title, the Georgia national title or the national title, feuding with Brad Armstrong. The number two uh, singles guy is Jake the Snake Roberts. He's holding on to this television title, the national television title, uh, feuding with Ronnie Garvin. And then you have the tag team. And doesn't that sound very familiar? That And a manager. So, I mean, if you look at the group like the Four Horsemen, 
where you had J.J. Dillon and he would have, you know, either Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson as the TV champion. He would have either Ole and Arn Anderson or Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson as the tag team champions. He would have Lex Luger or Tully Blanchard as the secondary singles guy. And of course, Ric Flair would be the top singles guy. That whole template is basically put down in 1983, 1984 by the Legion of Doom. Uh, like I said, the spoiler is the number one heel. Jake the Snake is the number two heel singles. And the Road Warriors are the tag team dominant uh, part of that four-person group. Very dominant group with only four members. They did do a storyline thing as well. They had King Kong Bundy, who was kind of being brought in as like a fifth member. I think the spoiler might have been phasing out around that time, but Bundy was being brought in. And then they did this very interesting angle where Paul Ellering was doing commentary with Paul with uh, Gordon Soley. And Paul Ellering thought they were in a commercial break, but they weren't. And Paul Ellering starts making fun of King Kong Bundy's weight and saying that if the Legion of Doom brought him in, they'd put him out of business because of all the buffet bills. So, I mean, a very interesting way to turn a guy babyface. King Kong Bundy did not appreciate the fat jokes. And we're off and running with the big feud of King Kong Bundy and an assortment of partners uh, from Ronnie Garvin to the mass superstar and Tim Horner and all points in between to take on the Road Warriors. And I just really feel like the Legion of Doom, what they did in about a year and a year and a half in Georgia was really kind of the template once again for what the Four Horsemen did later on. And, you know, most wrestling fans don't have this knowledge, don't have this insight. Uh, can't put two and two together to equal four, but yet somehow I pull that off. Number four, folks, once again, I think this is going to shock and amaze people. And once again, this is just personal favorites, uh, you know, so personal favorites. I really found these people to be a wonderful part of pro wrestling in kind of a boring time for wrestling. It was in the shadows of the Chris Benoit situation. Uh, the WWE was about to segue into the PG era. There was not a whole lot of stuff going on, but in total nonstop action wrestling, we had the beautiful people. Yes, I have a female group at number four. I mean, to me, Angelina Love, Velvet Sky, and they would add Madison Rain. They would add Lacey Von Erich. They kind of had Billy Gunn. I guess you could say Billy Gunn's on this list for the second time. And I, I think that's about it. I'm trying to think if there's any members that kind of came and went that I'm forgetting. But for me, the beautiful people, just Velvet Sky and Angelina Love were plenty. Um, I believe when they added Madison Rain, she was kind of the Buddy Roberts of the group. She was the one that could probably have the best wrestling matches. Uh, Velvet Sky was obviously the, uh, the cute factor, the pretty factor. Angelina Love was very attractive as well, but she kind of had more of a badass, you know, biker chick thing going. I just think that the beautiful people were vastly entertaining. I'm not alone in thinking that. I mean, the, the ratings apparently would always go much higher when these ladies were on television. They did a lot of fun segments. Uh, they were really like, a, as far as I can recall, uh, maybe one of the first female heel factions, unless I'm forgetting someone. They were copied. The WWE uh, copied them, I believe, with McCool. Uh, Layla and uh, Michelle McCool copied these two. Um, so, I mean, to me, the beautiful people, you know, all of them I thought were great. Even Lacey Von Erich, you know, she was not really a good wrestler, but she was obviously a beautiful woman and played the, the bimbo, you know, blonde bimbo part very well. But, I mean, Madison Rain, um, Velvet Sky, Angelita Love, I think was – in my mind, the real leader of this group. And I just thought they were fantastic. I really do. I think the, the theme song was great. I mean, it was like this very kind of catchy uh, theme song. You know, it was very different from pro wrestling. Uh, their entrance, very seductive. You know, Taz freaking out every time Velvet Sky went into the ring. Uh, just a lot of fun. I mean, I think, and, and the thing with some of these factions, they're all basically heels, but, you know, fun. I mean, the, their the faction should be fun in some regards. So I give it up to the beautiful people, number four. Number three, once again, I think I'm going to lose some of you guys. Some of you younger fans are not going to know who the, who the hell I'm talking about. But that's okay. Do your research. You know, do your Google searches. Uh, Varsity Club, I am looking at um, 
Kevin Sullivan was the mastermind, the games master, Mike Rotundo from the University of Syracuse, Rick Steiner from the University of Michigan. Uh, that was the original group. They had a nice storyline that, you know, basically it was the father choosing between the two sons. Uh, Kevin Sullivan was always kind of playing off these guys against each other, Rotundo and Steiner I'm talking about. Uh, they even had a thing where Mike Rotundo gave the Florida title to Rick Steiner. You know, when Jim Crockett Promotions bought out the Florida territory, uh, basically they just had these belts, and Rotundo's got this belt, he's got the TV belt, and he basically just gives the Florida title to Rick Steiner, which was hilarious in some regard. It's kind of sad if you're a Florida wrestling fan. But in any event, I really liked this group. I thought they were really good. They were basically mid-card, undercard guys, you know, playing second fiddle to the Four Horsemen. However, a lot of people think, and I think Kevin Sullivan always says this, that the Four, uh, the, the four Horsemen kind of held down the Varsity Club because the Varsity Club was getting more over. In fact, if you look behind me, you see this wonderful image. That's uh, Mike Rotundo defending the TV title against Nikita Koloff in Baltimore. Okay. And if you look at some of the, the lineage, I mean, you have Mike Rotundo in the varsity club. His son obviously was Bray Wyatt and Rick Steiner's son is Braun Breaker. So, I mean, you, you have this lineage that's continued. And also there was a couple of other members, Steve, Dr. Death Williams ended up replacing Rick Steiner in the group. Uh, I believe they were both in the group for a short period together. I mean, what a powerhouse. Steve Williams, Rick Steiner, Mike Rotundo, and Kevin Sullivan. Eventually, though, Steiner leaves the group. Uh, Steve, Dr. Death, and Rotundo defeated the Mighty Road Warriors at the Clash of Champions uh, 6. Uh, basically, a month later on pay-per-view at Music City Showdown, that same guy, Nikita Koloff, causes them as a special guest referee. They lose the title in kind of a, a interesting situation. I ba basically, they just lost the title by being stripped of the title. They never got beaten for the title, the world tag team title. Also, believe it or not, at the same show, uh, they had brought in another member of the varsity club, Danny Spivey, a guy that we would see in the skyscrapers, Whale and Mercy, which was a big influence for, of course, Bray Wyatt. But Danny Spivey was the basically the, the fifth or the sixth member of the varsity club. Um, you know, and he and Sullivan were challenging Eddie Gilbert and Rick Steiner for the uh, U.S. tag team titles. So very interesting group. They kind of just didn't have a good ending for some reason. I think they just turned Dr. Death babyface again. Like he he turned heel to join the group and then just turned babyface to get out of the group. And it wasn't really a good payoff. You know, even going that to the 1989 Great American Bash pay-per-view, you see um, you see uh, Mike Rotundo and Kevin Sullivan squabbling with each other when they lost a tornado match to the Steiners. Uh, my point is, it's too bad that the varsity, group, uh, varsity club did not have a proper send-off until about 12 years later, for whatever reason, the dying days of WCW, I think Starcade 2000, if I'm not mistaken, they dragged up the Varsity Club, maybe it was 99 or 2000, but they brought in the Varsity Club, I think, to back up, back up Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I want to say, was it, was it the Steiner-Rotundo version of the Varsity Club, or was it Steiner and Williams and Rotundo, whatever it was? They brought in the Varsity Club for some half-assed uh, stuff, I think, with Hacksaw Duggan and maybe the Canadian group, the Landstorm group, but it really made no sense. I think they had Kimono Wanalea in there from ECW. It was really ab abhorrent uh, that they were trying to do something with these guys after all that time. Anyway, I give the original incarnation of the Varsity Club, like the, uh, like I said, the 80s, uh, 87 to 89, I give them a big number three, which might shock and amaze you. Now we go to number two on this list. I'm sure a lot of you fine folks will be shocked and amazed that this group was not number one. New World Order. I'm giving them the number two. Uh, yes, Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, uh, Six, Ted DiBiase, Eric Bischoff, uh, Ray Trailer. Uh, once again, Mike Rotundo. Wow, he's on two of these groups. He's in number three and number two. Um, Scott Norton, Conan, uh, Kurt Henning for a period of time. 
all these wonderful little talents. Then you had the variants, and maybe this is kind of why the group is hurt. I mean, when you start doing the Wolf Pack with Lex Luger and Sting, and you know Randy Savage, of course, was in the original Black and White. When you start doing all these variants, um, it really was more is less, basically. When they started adding all these things to the NWO, it did become uh, more is less. But the first year or two of the New World Order, you know, say from ninety six to 98 99 i you know it's just we could talk here all day about the new world order but they were really an awesome powerful group the t-shirt such a huge sailor seller uh really gave hulk hogan a second half to his career and uh he made the most of it and i mean the things that they did with the crossover i mean the tonight show jay leno wrestling dennis rodman in the nwo all these wonderful things the japan new world order uh you know that group uh, with Chono and Muda and uh, even the spinoffs, the, the BWO parody group in ECW, the Latino world order that we still see today. I mean, you can't take much away from the new world order. So they're number two and you, you probably figured it out folks. I mean, you probably figured it out by now, even with my other, you know, list here, I, I made my first list and they both had horsemen number one and NWA number two. And then I kind of went around the circles with all the other listings. Um, maybe I'll put these lists on eBay for you people if you give a fuck. But uh, basically, I'm giving the number one to the Four Horsemen. I mean, how can you not? How can you not? I mean, um, yes, they did take certain elements, whether they knew it or not, from the Legion of Doom group a couple of years earlier. Uh, maybe they were aware of that. Maybe they weren't. And... The New World Order, of course, you could say sold more, more T-shirts and this, that, and the other. But as far as a group that was really pivotal in keeping the uh, National Wrestling Alliance alive in the time of, of Vince McMahon trying to destroy all the competition and, and all his father's colleagues, I think the Four Horsemen were really the glue that kept the Jim Crockett promotions together. And even in the early days of WCW, I, I kind of did like the 1990, you know, version of the Four Horsemen with Barry Windham and Sid Vicious and so forth. So, you know, I mean, we could talk here. We could have a whole different list of your 10 favorite Four Horsemen lineups. And people tend to shit on, you know, the lineups with Paul Roma and stuff like that. But, I mean, I just think that the Four Horsemen, uh, I would say from when they started – which it's interesting to me because I always thought that he started in like February of 86, but it's actually going back to November of 85. They're kind of mentioning the four horsemen when they're doing Starcade 85 in a, in a very slight way. But once they were off and running, you know, with JJ Dillon and so on and so forth, uh, Tully Blanchard, all these wonderful guys, Arn Anderson. I mean, to me, uh, the 85 to 91, 86 to early 91, and, of course, we had a couple of years where Flair would be gone or, you know, uh, well, actually, that came later. But Arn and Tully were gone for a year, and then Tully didn't come back. <clears throat> but I give the Four Horsemen the number one seed here. So that's my list. Uh, if you find folks happen to find this uh, topic uh, here, you're probably an old-school wrestling fan, maybe a new-school wrestling fan, maybe somewhere in between. You're always trying to gather knowledge. I mean, this is the channel to be on. I mean, and I'm not sitting here with a goddamn computer looking up any of this fucking information, by the way. This is all from the top of my fucking head, okay? So I don't need the goddamn Google because I have all this wonderful information, all this wonderful insights in my brain percolating around, okay? So you can come here you can watch Mike's Pro Wrestling Rants or not, but I'm here for you with my wonderful discussions, my wonderful insights, and so on and so forth. And if you're like my buddy there, Mark Thiefke, or my pal, Shane McKenna, uh, Michael A.J. Norris, all these wonderful viewers, uh, Laurence from Australia, they always have these wonderful topics. And sometimes I don't get around to all of them because I'm such a busy guy, okay? My own films are on one man in a camera films. My artwork, my visual artwork is on one artist, Mike Messier. I'm so busy with all the things that I do uh, that I can't sit here and talk about wrestling all the time. But today, I wanted to make the exception and, and address this issue and answer the question, Mike, who are your favorite top 10 wrestling factions? Now, you find folks, you can leave uh, your, own, your own comments. <coughs> God in heaven. 
Now I'm choking up. That's it. Mike Messier. Go to MikeMessier.com. Scroll down. Stand me by my books.